Well, good morning, City Light. My name is Joe, and I'm one of the pastors here. Um, thank you, Micah, for reading our word. And uh, if you have not yet, go ahead and open your Bibles and turn there to Colossians uh, chapter 2, verses 6 to 7. That's where we're going to be rooted this morning. And, and as you're getting there, I have a question for you this morning. Have you ever, or are you now, in a relationship with someone, and maybe this is a family member, where you know you like them, you know you love them, but you're not quite sure how much you trust them. So like, you know you like to be around them, you know that, that they're kind of cool to hang out with, but you're not going to let them plan anything important, like a family vacation or, or something like that. Well, I had this friend in high school um, that was about to turn 16. And he was uh, the first one in our little group of friends that was turning 16. And he talked for weeks and weeks and weeks leading up to his 16th birthday about this car that his dad uh, was going to allow him to use. It was their family car. It was like their third car. And he basically said, you know what? This car is basically mine. I'm going to be able to do whatever I want, whenever I want. It's going to be awesome. So, of course, we're all pumped because that means we're going to get chauffeured around the city. This is going to be amazing. Look out, Omaha. Uh, and so, uh, so his 16th birthday rolls around, he comes into school, and he comes in real happy. I mean, this man's got some swagger. He's got the oversized Oakleys. He's got the, the driving gloves on. Like, he's ready to rock and roll. And so we're like, all right, well, I guess this is actually happening, so let's, let's do this. Um, but I quickly find out that uh, this man's dad probably loves him a lot, but he doesn't even trust him a little bit. And the reason I find that out is because through the course of our conversation, as we're trying to make plans, I realize a couple of things. Number one, he's not actually allowed to have passengers in his car. He has to drive by himself anywhere that he goes. So that throws out any form of initial plan of going out and doing these things. And so I'm like, okay, well, let's, let's just improvise a little bit. Maybe I can get my mom to like drop us off at Crossroads Mall. You can just meet us there. And we can hang out. And for you kids, like, Crossroads was an actual place that we hung out. I know that's hard to believe, but it was a thing. So, um, so you know, we're trying to improvise. And um, unfortunately, that plan is not going well either because he lets us know that actually I can't drive on the interstate either. Like, okay, well, I mean, there's a street called 72nd. goes right by there. He said, yeah, that would be great too, but I, uh, I actually can't go north of Harrison Street. Like, you can't cross Harrison Street. No, it's, it's too busy of an intersection. And I'm like, okay, all right, well, this, I, I, I'm not exactly sure what we're going to do, but you know what, Let's, let me, I'm trying to salvage the situation. The man's excited, like I said, oversized Oakleys. And, he's, uh, and so I'm like, okay, well, man, tell me about this car. Like, you know, can you, like, at least leave it in your driveway and play the stereo and get some speakers in it? Come to find out, his dad actually removed the stereo uh, because it might be a distraction. Now, I look out and I see some kids that are probably around 16. And this is, I know your parents have probably got some rules for you, but just let me remind you, this is a different time. I drove and rode in the bed of a pickup truck my whole life. In the winter, too. I didn't know kids were allowed to be in the front cab. I didn't know seat belts could actually go around kids, okay? So... Things have changed a little bit, but, but at this point, I finally look at my friend and I said, man, I don't think your dad trusts you very much. He said, no, 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 he does, he does. He let me drive to school this morning. I said, bro, you live right across the street. You literally walked farther when you parked your car and walked down from the parking lot than if you had just gone out your front door and come to school this morning. And so clearly, his dad loved him. He cared about him. But he obviously did not trust him with having full reign of this car. And so I wonder this morning, if we're being honest, I think this is what many of us tend to do with Jesus. We like him. We like his grace. We love his salvation. Uh, but we're not sure that we trust him with the important stuff, like our lives. Like, I like the fact that he atoned for my sins I'm cool with, with, with the idea of being right with God, but I'm not so okay with the idea of maybe losing some control in my life or giving up some comfort or, or even, God forbid, delaying gratification. And the problem with this church, 
why this matters for us this morning is that if Jesus is not leading, fully leading our lives, then that leaves us for the job. Or worse yet, someone or something else. The problem is that we are woefully underqualified to be the Lord's in our own lives. Not only are, 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 are we limited in every way, Jesus is unlimited in every way. And not only that, he actually wants good for us. In fact, this, this, this is a hard thing to grasp, but he actually wants more good for you than you want for yourself. Let me say that again. Jesus actually wants more good for you than you want for yourself. That's why he left heaven. That's why he came to earth. It's for his glory, which is for our good. And so this morning... We're going to see Paul in the book of Colossians show us that Jesus is more than just a savior, more than just a friend, more than just a counselor. He is certainly all of those things, but importantly, he is our Lord, and we can fully trust him with every part of our life. So let's go ahead and jump in. I'm going to have two observations from the text this morning, and the first is this, Jesus is Lord. Very simple. Jesus is is Lord. Look with me at uh, Colossians chapter 2, the very first part of verse 6. Therefore, as you receive Christ Jesus the Lord, all right, so let's go ahead and stop here. And I think we need to appreciate the depth of the statement that Paul has unpacked there. He has just got done writing. We've been in the book of Colossians, I think, for six, seven, eight weeks, something like that. We've gone through uh, the whole first chapter and now the very first part of chapter 2. And Paul has just gotten done painting this huge picture of who Christ is. That he is preeminent in creation. That, that creation was done by him and for him. And that he is sufficient in every way to hold creation up. To, to give it life. To, to, to push it through. And so Paul has painted this big picture. And now he's going to get down into to very specific into our lives. He's not only going to tell us what Jesus is, but who he is to us personally and how that works out uh, through our lives. And so people um, in this church and in the community um, are trying to tell the Colossians that Jesus can only get them so far. There's a lot of false teaching and, and different things like that that are leading the Colossians astray. They're saying, yes, you guys need Jesus for salvation. He's a part of that, but there's something deeper that you must find for yourselves. They're saying, yes, you need Jesus for, for salvation, but you also need to, to pray to angels, and so all these weird spirits don't attack you. You also uh, need to work yourself up into these emotional visions. Otherwise, you know, you're not really tapping into this deep spirituality. The cross of Jesus is necessary, but it will only get you so far. They're saying that, that there is still work to be done that the cross of Christ did not accomplish. But Paul, all through the first chapter, and especially here, is saying no. He's saying the, the fullness of Jesus that I just unpacked for a whole chapter, his sufficiency is also there, and he's fully sufficient for you, and fully sufficient for you personally. And so... Um, he is sufficient not just for the trees and the grass and creation, but he's sufficient for you. He is not just the, the historical as well as the future savior, but he's the current leader and sustainer of your life. And this idea of lordship, it's important because I think we're tempted to be okay with parts of Jesus, but not all of him. We are okay with Jesus the savior, Jesus the atoner, but we're not okay with Jesus the Lord, the one who would speak into our lives and direct our lives in every area. But Paul here is saying that Jesus the Savior and Jesus the Lord are mutually exclusive. That's why he put this statement together the way that he did. Christ Jesus the Lord. He, he put that together in that way because you cannot divorce the two. He's saying that, that, that you don't get one without the other. Jesus is Savior and Lord. Christ the Lord. 
There's a, a famous quote from uh, just recently departed evangelist Billy Graham that goes like this. No man can be said to be truly converted to Christ who has not bent his will to Christ. He may give intellectual assent to the claims of Christ and may have even had emotional religious experiences. However, he is not truly converted until he has surrendered his will to Christ as Lord. Almost 14 years ago, I married my wife Whitney in a small church in a small town in Oakland, Nebraska. She looked amazing. I looked slightly less than average. And let me tell you, I did a lot of work to get to that slightly less than average. There were a lot of people there. There's a photographer. There were friends, a bunch of food. There was a dance. It was an amazing party. However, a few weeks later, we settled into this thing called marriage. We had this amazing event, an amazing moment, but what came after that was a lifelong covenant commitment to each other to love and serve each other for the rest of our lives. This didn't just mean that I got a new roommate that smelled better and liked better coffee than I did. I certainly got that, for sure. But it meant that there was now a person whose love was going to change every area of my life. How I used time, how I spent money, what I valued. Being married didn't just change my status, it changed my life. And City Light, this is what Christ as Lord does in us. He doesn't just change our status in front of a loving Father, he certainly does that, but he changes every little part of our life. So first, Paul reminds the Colossians that the Jesus they received is in fact Lord, now look how he continues in the second half of the verse. Verse 6 still. Therefore, as you receive Christ Jesus as Lord, so walk in him. So walk in him. So here Paul shows us that Jesus being our Lord actually means something. That we should walk in him. Other translations say, say to live our lives in him. And so this is not a passive acceptance, but it's an active participation. Paul is saying the fact that you are in Jesus means that your life, like it should actually look different. And notice the order here. The order is very, very important. First, you receive him, then you walk in him. Paul is not saying that we start by living in Jesus to somehow close the gap. He's saying first we receive him and then we follow him. He's saying you have already, by grace, through faith, received Jesus, and so now live life in him. And City Light, I think this should be probably a very relieving thing for us to know because we can read that and see, okay, walk in him. Okay, so this creator of the universe that is perfectly sufficient in every way, I now need to walk in step with him. And we can look at that and think, how on earth is this going to work? Last week, I ate lunch twice on the same day because I forgot I ate it the first time. How on earth am I going to walk in step with the creator of the universe, right? Like, it's not going to go well. But Paul reminds us, we received Jesus. We didn't chase him down. We didn't catch him. We received him through faith by grace. And so it's out of that same grace and by that same faith that we can walk with him. And so... If Jesus is to be our Lord and have access to every single part of our life, what does that mean? I think that puts the question on the table of how. Like, what, what does this look like? What are, what are some ways that we can do that? And this is where Paul transitions to three illustrations to show us what walking in Jesus looks like. And so uh, my second observation from the text is this. Three ways to walk in him. And one of the reasons I named it this is because Gavin and Chris always say, you're never going to hear a sermon about three points to be able to do anything. Well, guess what? <laughs> but it's from Paul. I didn't do this myself. Um, uh, so look with me at verse 7. Rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding 
in thanksgiving. And so for, for, for this observation, what I want to do is I just want to walk through the three things that we see Paul line up there and, 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 and kind of talk through some of those things and, and, and what's going on. And so the first illustration that we see um, is this idea of being rooted and built up in him. So Paul uses this image of, of a plant or, or a tree and, and also uses this image of a building, so an agricultural and a construction metaphor. But what he's doing is showing us that Jesus is to establish both the foundation of and the ongoing substance of your life. So when he says rooted, we are to stay, we are to stay rooted, we are to abide in Jesus. And so we don't move on from there. It's not Jesus plus something. It's Jesus alone that we stay rooted in. Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches, abide in me. And so when Paul talks about being rooted in Jesus, that's what he's talking about. But then also he says to be built up in him. And this is a process as we are rooted in and abiding in Jesus, we are actually being conformed to his image. He is not being conformed to us to fit in our little box, but we are being conformed to look more like him. Do you see that? By brooding and abiding in Jesus, we are built up to be more and more in his image. And so what I want to really focus on in this metaphor is that phrase, in him. In him, the only place that will be rooted or built up is in Jesus. There is no deeper spirituality to be had beyond Christ. There's no secret way to be rooted in, in something deeper other than Christ. You might as well try to plant a tree in the parking lot if you're going to try to root yourself into something other than Christ. Or you might as well try to build a house out of popsicle sticks and scotch tape if you try to build yourself up into something other than Christ. So it's not about the next self-help book or, or the, new, the new age way to achieve self-actualization. Do you guys know that the, the self-help industry in the United States is $9.9 .9 billion with a B? There's all kinds of things out there where we think we can find just, just this deeper truth that we've been missing. But I'm here to tell you it's not about finding your perfect spot on the Enneagram. It's not about finding your perfect personality match on Myers-Briggs. Not that these things are bad in themselves, but we will not find anything more deeper and more complete than Jesus. The Christian life is not primarily about what, but about who. One of uh, our ongoing prayers for our kids is that they would know and love Jesus and and when, when, when Whitney and I pray for that, our hope is not that they would just meet Jesus, get baptized, and get involved in some fun church activities, but that they would simply walk with God for a lifetime. That when my wife and I drop them off at college, they go as missionaries looking to impact those around them, and not as individuals simply looking to conform to culture. That if they get married, if they choose to get married, that they would choose a spouse based on their godly character and their love for Jesus, not just their appearance or their earning potential. Although I will say, if daddy gets a beach house in San Diego, I'm okay with that. I'm just going to throw that out there, but he does need to love Jesus. Jesus and the beach house will take that, claim it. You see, the, the, the Christian life can easily devolve into a list of things to do and to be a part of but it's absolutely worthless unless it's rooted and built up in the person of Jesus. Amen? All right, next illustration. Established in the faith just as you were taught. Established in the faith just as you were taught. So Paul here is not telling us to be established in faith, but in the faith. He's telling the Colossians and us to be established in what they have learned and what we have learned from the disciples about who Jesus is as he backs this statement up with just as you were taught. And remember, Jesus didn't appear in bodily form to the Colossians and teach them about himself, but he used Epaphras to be the one that would bring the good news to them. And so what this means is that these truths of who Jesus are is, is handed down by people, sinful, imperfect people. 
But most importantly, people whom Jesus directly gave authority to do so. Let's look at Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 to 20. This is after Jesus rose from the dead and before he ascended into heaven, and he's talking to his disciples. And he says, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and surely I am with you to the end of the age. Go make disciples, teaching them to observe everything that I commanded you. So Jesus gave authority to the disciples to teach the truths about himself to the world. Then later we see Paul tells Titus in that book, but as for you, teach what accords with sound doctrine. He tells Timothy in that book to guard the good deposit entrusted to him and to follow the pattern of sound teaching and doctrine. So what we learn from this is that doctrine actually matters. Doctrine helps us to clarify who Jesus is and how to apply that to our lives. We have to know what we believe to be able to live what we believe. But this can get uh, quite sticky, if we're honest. I come from a, a faith tradition where doctrine was used to control people, was used to add on all these extra regulations that you needed to be able to do to add on Jesus and this, right, instead of focusing simply on Jesus. And so that word, if you're like me, that word doctrine makes you throw up in your mouth a little bit, right? If you're with me, let's be honest. I, I don't like this word. When I saw this, I was like, dang it. Can't, like, Chris or Gav come up and, and teach this? But, but in reality, like, this is an important thing. When We want to say, hold on, okay, so we see that, that Jesus gave authority to the disciples, but that was over 2,000 years ago. All those disciples are long gone. How on earth do we know exactly what they taught? How do we know that, that, uh, what they taught to, to the people around them? And I think this is where we have to understand, this is where the Bible comes in. This is where this thing comes in. Like God used Epaphras to bring the good news to the Colossians, he also used unlikely people and inspired them to write the words in this book. All these scriptures have been interpreted over years and years and years by, by different people. And yes, sometimes they've been interpreted incorrectly. And sometimes they've interpreted them in ways to back up sin and evil that they were perpetrating. So absolutely, doctrine has been used very, very negatively. And these scriptures have been used very, very negatively. And I think what happens when this happens is that we just want to throw our hands up, right? And say, you know what? We can't trust anything any human has said about Jesus, But the reality is, the Bible hasn't changed. The doctrines of grace have always been evident. And there is a significant need and benefit to understand time-tested, Bible-confirmed, orthodox doctrine. Bobby Jameson defines doctrine this way. Sound doctrine is a summary of the Bible's teaching that is both faithful to the Bible and useful for life. Not useful for debate, not useful to look smart in front of your friends, but useful for life. Faithful to what? What you want to do? No. Faithful to the Bible. Helpful doctrine simply tries to summarize what is already there, not reading something into the text that is not there. And I think we see the ramifications of people getting away from these doctrines. When you have nothing to ground yourself in, your feelings then become your chief teacher. Your view of God is shaped by what you feel and experience and not always necessarily by the truth. When we see ourselves as rebellious or bad or imperfect, we don't like the idea of a just God who has wrath. And so we tell ourselves that a loving God would never punish us and that he really doesn't care too much about what we do. 
when we feel like we're basically good and better than, than the people around us. We don't like the idea of a God who gives us a simple path to grace through his son. And so we start to want to put all these regulations on being able to deserve the grace that he freely gives us. You see this play out in large movements like uh, in things like universalism that says that everyone will be justified regardless of where their faith lies. That there, there are many paths to the same God, but we see in the Gospel of John in chapter 14 that Jesus calls himself the way, the truth, and the life, and that no one comes to the Father except through him. See this play out in the prosperity gospel, where if you have enough faith, you'll be wealthy, healthy, and happy. But the reality is, we see Jesus say over and over again to store up treasures in heaven, where moth and, and rust does not destroy. We also see that a primary aspect of Jesus' life is suffering. And we see that a primary aspect of, of the early believers' lives was suffering. You see it in things like fundamentalist movements, where the Bible is used to usurp power to shame sinners and to oppress people. But we see Jesus encounter these type of people all the time. In the New Testament, they're called Pharisees. And he calls them whitewashed tombs. They look good on the outside, but nothing but death on the inside. These people are not experiencing the grace and freedom and life that comes through Jesus Christ. Now, I just named three ways that we can be led astray, and that's just inside the church. That's not even saying anything about culture and the winds that blow in our culture and always want to get us off track. There is a reason that Paul says to be established in the faith here, just as you were taught. It actually matters that we know our Bibles, what it says, and how others have interpreted it through the centuries. All right, lastly, look with me at the third description of walking with Jesus, which is abounding in thanksgiving. Abounding in thanksgiving. Now remember, Paul is showing us how to be rooted in Jesus and not be led astray by plausible teachings. Why would he say something like abounding in thanksgiving? I think the answer there is that thanksgiving and being thankful are an overflow of truly understanding that which we were saved from and that which we are being saved to. If we fully understand our, our plight in life and what we've been saved from and the glory to come in the life to come, we would, it would produce in us and it does produce in us an overflow of thankfulness. We are also not likely to fall for the lie that there is some deeper truth out there, some deeper reality, some deeper spirituality than Jesus. And we will know that because we know the awesome sufficiency of Christ. If there is no area of our life that his hand is not in, if there is no area in our life that he cannot speak into, why would we look anywhere else for something deeper? The truth is here that following Christ, obeying what he commanded, and handing our lives over to him does not produce in us a muted sense of duty, but an overwhelming sense of thankfulness. And it's also not that Christians don't experience pain or tragedy or mourning or, or not that they experience like a lesser form of, of pain and of mourning. No, that would, that would cheapen the grace and the joy that we have in Jesus. But the truth is, that, that when you are rooted in Jesus and overflowing with thankfulness is that even amidst the pain, even amidst just the searing pain that can come in this life and lamenting and mourning, there can also at the same time be a sense of thankfulness, of joy, and of gratitude. People who are rooted and established in Christ can have actual joy and actual thankfulness in the midst of searing pain. If I had a bottle of water here in my hand and I squeezed it, what would come out? Water, right? Why? Because water is inside of it, and so water is going to come out when you squeeze it. Likewise, in our lives, when things go wrong, when the pressures of, of life bear down on us, when, when bad things happen to us and we are squeezed, what is inside of us is going to come out as well. And so if we are overflowing, if we are abounding in thankfulness, that will be a part of what is coming out. So last week I had the, the pleasure to visit my friend Richard in the hospital. Um, and, and Richard is an old saint that has been following Jesus for way more years than I've been alive. Uh, but he's had a tough last couple of years. 
um, as his, his health has continued to decline. And just over a year ago, Richard lost his dear wife um, of over 50 years. And since then, Richard has tried to continue living without her, but to be honest, it's not the same. To be honest, it never will be the same. There's always going to be pain and sorrow and heartache um, and just kind of a hole uh, that, that he had uh, for over 50 years. So anyway, a sickness landed Richard in the hospital a few weeks ago. Um, and as I sat there with him for a few minutes, I noticed pretty quickly that he was in quite a bit of pain. So on top of the sickness that landed him in the hospital, he also said that his vertebrae and his back are actually grinding against each other. There's no cartilage left uh, between the discs. And so uh, he's, he's, the doctors have told him that he's too sick uh, to be able to have surgery, and so this is just his life now. He's got a, a, incredible pain. He was there. He kept having to move, and you could just see him grimace the whole time. But, but despite the pain, as I sat there with Richard, he told me how thankful he was for the grace of Jesus. And as tears rolled down his cheeks, he told me how undeserving he was of how good Jesus had been to him. Richard was being squeezed, and out of him, overflowing out of him, was thankfulness for his Savior. That, would, that we would be the same at the end of our lives would, would be a big prayer of mine, amen? And City Light, can I just thank you and brag on you guys for a little bit? I absolutely love being around you all. You are truly a church that is thankful for what Jesus has done in you, through you, and out from you. When I sit in, in worship with you guys, I see it, I hear it. I see and hear a church that is overflowing and abounding in thankfulness. When I look at your generosity in all areas of your life, your time, your talents, your resources, your finances, I see a people that are overflowing with thankfulness. When I see the way that you love each other and run at others within our community, I see a church that is overflowing with thankfulness. So church, thank you for providing a place that is overflowing with joy and thankfulness that I can bring my family into, that I can bring my kids into, and that I can invite my neighbors into, that they can see the love and joy and thankfulness that you have that would point to and glorify our Savior. And as we close, I just want to share a little bit of my experience with this idea of Jesus being my Lord. For years after placing my faith in Christ, there was always a little bit of hesitation in me to be fully and totally abandoned to Christ. He was certainly my Lord. He directed many, many areas of my life. But if I'm honest, I was definitely blocking off significant parts of my life because I didn't trust him. I didn't trust, you know, Lord, what if your plans are not the same as my plans? What if your plans include pain? What if your plans include suffering? What if your plans include something I don't think I want right now? So there was a period in our lives several years ago where my, where my wife and I went through some miscarriages that were very difficult. And around this time, I remember someone told me that they would frequently play, pray to God to do whatever he needed to within them to accomplish his will through them. In other words, what they were saying is, Lord, do whatever you need to do in my heart because I want to be fully abandoned to you. And that just clicked with me as we're going through pain and going through these things. It's like, yes, what have I been doing? He's God. He literally created me. Why am I treating him like a teenager that I can't hand over full reins to a car with yet? Then I realized that this is a God that not only created me, but he left heaven and he suffered so that I could be with him. Not only is he a God who is all-powerful and all-knowing, but this is a God that I can trust because he moved towards me first. So City Light, I'm not sure where you are this morning. Maybe you've never handed your life over to Christ. Or maybe like me, you had certain areas of your life where you know consciously you are holding these back from Jesus. That you do not yet trust him into this area of your life. And if this is you this morning, I just want to encourage you that his grace is sufficient for you. His provision is sufficient for you. His love is sufficient for you. You will find no better leader, 
no better person that wants more good for you than you even do yourself. So stop holding back. Stop trying to navigate on your own, but surrender. Abandon everything you have to him. He is the only one qualified to be the Lord of your life.